you who are joining One Book, One New Orleans for the first time, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. And as the name suggests, One Book, One New Orleans selects one book each year, and we encourage everyone in the city to read the same book at the same time with the intention that we're going to grow stronger as a community through a shared reading experience. Now, in fulfilling our mission, we have to recognize that among adults in our city, the functional literacy rate is approximately 27%. So we do extra layers of outreach to make sure that when we say we're one book, one New Orleans, we actually mean it. We do this by developing a curriculum around the selected book, and we get that book into adult education programs in Orleans Parish, as well as six other parishes throughout Louisiana. So the selected book each year is used to teach adults to read. In addition, we also get it into both adult and juvenile prisons, and we get it into the ears of the blind and the print disabled thanks to a partnership with WRBH Reading Radio for the Blind. And finally, for those who love to read yet don't have the resources to purchase books, we remove that barrier by making sure that every branch of the New Orleans Public Library has a copy. Now, to bring folks together through our shared reading adventure, we have events like this one that are inspired by our selected book. And our 2021 selection is The Yellow House by Sarah M. Broom. And some of the themes that emerge through the book are storytelling and who gets to tell the story, whether that is the story of a family or a city or uh, a place, and also the concept of value and what or who determines the worth or the value of a place. Now, as it turns out, Bard Early College New Orleans also selects one book as its school-wide read, and this year, it's The Yellow House by Sarah M. Broom. So tonight, Bard Early College New Orleans students Jada Edwards and Peyton Jasmine will discuss their experiences of reading The Yellow House and their reflections on the value of the places that are most dear to them. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Jesse Owens, Dean of Studies and Professor at Bur Bard Early College in New Orleans to tell you more. Hi, and thank you so much, Liz. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I am, so at Barterly College New Orleans, we offer an immersive liberal arts program for college junior, high school juniors and seniors across New Orleans who are interested in starting college early. It's an immersive experience. Um, largely, we do uh, collegiate level coursework. And in the spirit of that collegiate level coursework, we offer a class called Seminar, which is an inquiry-based course in the humanities and social sciences. Um, this year, we actually have eight books. So I will say we have a lot of books across the course of the year. Um, but this year in the spring, we read The Yellow House. Um, and I had the pleasure of having Jada Edwards in our seminar this year. Our central inquiry in the seminar was what is value? And for our second essay, we had a, a prompt that was name a value central to how Sarah M. Broom tells the story in the Yellow House. How does this value inform how her family lives there and how they persist as a family after the structure is gone? So in response to this, uh, response to this essay prompt, our student Jada Edwards has written an essay and she's going to join us now. Jada, e. Edward, Jada Edwards is, uh, we call her Jada E, but Jada Edwards is a junior at Rosenwald Collegiate, and she would like to become a criminal justice lawyer in, when she grows up. She's also a first year at Barterly College, and we are so glad to have her. Jada, would you like to share with us a piece of your essay? Nature took over their safe place. The other house was the, their meeting in every minute, danger of collapsing. One of... 1,975 houses to appear on the red danger list. Houses bearing bright red stickers, no no larger than a small hand. Without their knowledge, it was already gone. As Sarah Broome said, looks like nothing was ever there. It was like their childhood flashed before their eyes, most importantly, their father's memory, and everything that made him seem alive just died. As Sarah Broome quoted, as long as the house stood contained these remains, my father was not yet gone. 
they can't really just accept it because they are still living in the moment of grief. It turns into their biggest loss and failures, failures of their family and others' families. My mother stayed my mother stayed in the car, refusing to look. I recognize this behavior of hers as disappointment. This is her home. It was made for her children's home. Also, this is the home that she owns, that she thought that no one could take away from her or that she'll never lose it. Because after all, this was property of Iris made. This matter because this was just a home that they just rented and planned to move out in a couple of years. This was a home that was supposed to stay up and pass on to generation to generation. Now the house is gone. All they can do is reflect on what they could have done differently or say, or say the things that they wish they did instead. They are stuck in misery and can't find any way out of it because, because home is where they have a sense of peace. A house is just made out of wood. A home is a place you come for protection from the outside world. In the movie, The Wizard of Eyes, the character of Dorothy said, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. In other words, there's no place like New Orleans. Sarah went away to burn, burn it out of the reach of her family. I have re, I have traveled all the way to burn for people in, in a place I, I would never know. Why on earth when they return home? I decided to return return here because I was afraid to. James Baldwin has written in 1961. To finish James Baldwin's statement for Sarah, she was afraid to face her reality, to actually accept that the house that she grew up in is gone. Some of the family didn't come home because it was felt as though New Orleans didn't have, it, have what they needed or they couldn't afford to move back home, referring to her mother's words. It was time to come home because, referring to my mother's words, it was time to come home because Dallas, Texas had a different vibe. Everything was spaced out, and there was no corner stores. It's like it, w it would take you at least 20 minutes to get to Walmart, then New Orleans, it was right up the street. We knew we had to come home because we were not familiar with the area, or there were no familiar faces. It was like it was like we're alone and no one to depend on. New Orleans is the only place where if you walk up the street, you can say, how you doing, a good morning, you wouldn't get looked that crazy. In quote. No one wants to say, no one to stay somewhere they feel as though they are an outcast and don't belong. The only place that seemed like they're all into their culture and no place like Nola. Carl, Carl, her big brother, stayed during the African trip. It was like Carl had a brother relationship with the house. Even when the house was already gone, he was still caring for the property by cutting the grass. But before the house got cut down, he went back. We, Sarah Brown quoted, we were here. It was apparently as witness to what Carl had come through to retrieve in some way, not the weed eater, but the memories. End quote. It was like his since a home left his body, his soul kept bringing him back to where the house used to be. Sarah Brown quoted, when Carl finally invited me to cut the, cut the grass when it was deep summertime hurricane season, this is his bring you to the realization that the children are, are the house. The house is nothing without the people that used to live in, the, live in it. No matter where they, were, they are in the world, everyone walk around with a piece of memory of, of the house, our culture of New Orleans. Sarah Broom never grew up fatherless when, when she had brothers to lead her down a path to success. They feel the peace of a missing father. The house is still still here in spirit. Take take on a knowledge that they learned and were taught, taught by living in New Orleans East. A house breaks down and pieces get lost, but your memories are always there. Sarah Monique Broom and her family are living in living in grief, grief and stayed in a moment change. A change that broke her family family, but made them strong along the way that brought them closer and to the realization that they have what they need, which is one another to tell a story and never let the house die. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Jada. That was so powerful. I am so glad to have you uh, in our class discussions and to share this with us and with the wider community. It's just absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. And I agree, um, absolutely. Sometimes I forget when I'm in other places and I say hello to people on the street and they think I've lost my mind. So thanks for that reminder of how special this place is that we live. Um, next up, we have um, Peyton Jasmine, who is a second year uh, in Bard Early College. She is about to graduate with her associate's degree and her high school degree from Frederick Douglass High School. Um, she will be attending Fisk University in the fall, studying biology and pre-med as her intended major. Peyton Jasmine, please take it away. Hello guys, my name is Peyton Jasmine, like Dr. said, and today I'll be um, 
telling you guys about a research essay I wrote on memoirs and Sarah M. Broom in The Yellow House was my inspiration. So before I get started, I have a PowerPoint that I want to share with you guys. So the title of this PowerPoint is called This Memory of Ours, and it's also the title of my research essay. And it's kind of a play on words. If you know what a memoir is, you share these memories, not only yourself, but others. So before I read, what exactly is a memoir? Fun fact, the term memoir comes from the French word for memory. But the definition of a memoir is, it usually gets used interchangeably with autobiographies, but they are different in a way. Despite the fact that both focus on the aspect of life, memoirs usually pinpoint an assortment of memories to answer a broader question in the author's life. What was the meaning of how I lived? So what question am I trying to answer in my um, research essay? Who, who are memoirs written for, the author or the reader? So next I'll be reading an excerpt of my research paper. It is important to remember that memoirs are not always written by the people who are mentioned. So their feelings and, their, and thoughts are being retold to another person. For example, to bring up the yellow house, Broom did not always talk about herself. Her mother, grandmother, great grandmother, and so forth were mentioned in the book with their feelings being told in the story. They weren't the ones writing them. This is where the ideas of autobiographies and autobiographies are the same as memoirs, but they couldn't be more different. Memoirs gain importance through different readers because it can take them to a place that is unlike their world. Kristen, who wrote Why Memoirs Are Important, quotes, memoirs have the potential to teach you about lifestyles, places, and experiences that are completely different from your own. They allow you to enter another person's world, which will help you to better understand and empathize with those around you. Memoirs don't always have to relate to the reader. Different perspectives can give different from around the world, cultural knowledge, and a metropolitan outlook on others' life. Why do we need memoirs? That's a heavy and loaded question. That could be like asking, why do we need books in the first place? As stated before, memoirs are a special type of literature that differs from other types of writing that may have similarities. What makes a memoir more important and has more depth rather than an autobiography or biography would have? A psychologist named Liz Scott has an opinion on why we need memoirs. Scott opens her articles explaining about her occupation and her 40 year experience and how it wasn't until a client came in one day and gave her a retrospective idea on what is their view on memoirs. She quotes, I had recently with a client gave me some insight about memoirs, maybe not why I chose to write one, but how the value of that kind of project brings you. So go back and dig deeper into the question who the memoir is written for. The author is the one it's still leaning towards. Being able to write down your, your thoughts and story is good for a writer, and some might argue that that is the only thing that matters. To me, memoirs are brave. That re memoirs that are brave that reveal our vulnerabilities and deepest humanity are instruments of public service. I come at that from the at from both the personal and the societal viewpoint. If someone does the hard work of examining her experiences and in the end grows as a person, that's a spectacular result. And as people evolve and grow, they are more likely to engage with the world in an original way. Really, the only way for societies to involve is for its individual members to grow. Individual change has, individual change has a societal ripple. It's got why we need memoirs. The reader and the author can grow from the experience of a memoir. When an author is creating this piece, it can be a sense of therapy, a therapeutic and emotional time in their life where they are releasing and exposing their demons. Memoirs can be inspirational. Reading someone else's life, who you assume has no relation to, relation to your life in a way can inspire you the reader to do better. History and genealogy also play a big part in the takeaways from the reader's point of view. Say for instance, you are an author who is interested in historical memoirs. This can give you and your family's story, this can keep you and your family's stories alive and give personal first-hand accounts of these incidents. It is becoming more evident that memoirs are multiple pieces that cannot be boxed into just one interpretation. To sum up everything, memoirs are unique pieces of writing that everyone should experience, whether they be the reader or the writer. Memoirs have a way of extracting certain feelings out of people by exploring them and taking time to analyze how sequences of events can affect a person throughout their life, even if those events didn't directly happen to them. Memoirs are undoubtedly written for the, the writer. The act of writing a piece of work where you can explore how different events shaped your life or loved ones is of lives or the ones close to you 
has been put into place to preserve and understand interpersonal relationships. Even though the reader is a big part of the author's journey, the book is just written for their entertainment. Memoirs are important because this is how we connect not only to each other, but to ourselves. Everyone can benefit from a memoir and it's important to understand the importance of these works of literature and the impact it has made on many lives. Memoirs are memories for us to share. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Peyton. I really appreciate this. Um, I've learned a lot in this in this research essay, and I know that um, this was a process that you know took very a couple of months, right? That that you were working on this um, as a part of your research project for advanced seminar, um, second year seminar. Um, so I just would, yeah, <laughs> thank you for the joke, Justin. Um, I want to joke around a little bit more, and I want to think about just taking back to your essay, you said, why do we need memoirs? And I would love to ask you or Jada, if you'd like to join us, is the first question I have is, why do we need this memoir, this memoir? Why do you think that this memoir has had such an impact, both in terms of the awards that it's swept, the millions of readers that it's, that it's reached? Um, and of course, it's also the one book, One New Orleans. So why do you think we need this memoir now? I think we need this memoir in particular is because people have this tunnel vision, like mindset or viewpoint on what New Orleans is. Mm -hmm. All they talk about is Bourbon Street, the French Quarter. They believe that it's just this party city and they don't mm -hmm. understand the different parts of it, especially yeah. the East. The East is kind of like a place where people don't really talk about it, especially mm -hmm. the forest of people outside of the world. Locals even think it's a dangerous place, but what they don't understand is, you know, it's people who live there, people who were pushed out of their homes in the city and had and were forced to relocate to New Orleans East. So I feel like the memoir, and it connects the people in the city together. Mm -hmm. And if you're a reader from out of the state, you know, it just gives you a look on the people who really live here rather than, you know, the French Quarter and all that, the touristy parts, you know, the different parts that make up New Orleans, which the East also is. It's also a part of New Orleans. Yeah, it's, it very much is. Jada, do you have anything you'd like to add? Why do you think we need this memoir? I agree with Peyton. Because when I look at the East, my mom always told me the East was dangerous. She'll be like, keep thinking it's called Jada. Because <laughs> when we were ugly, my first is Titan. This changed my outlook on the world. It's East. I always thought it was a dangerous place. I never thought about where people live there. Of course, I see houses, but I never really looked at it like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think also, you know, as we were reading, we talked a lot in our discussions in class. And I think probably also, Peyton, this comes out in your memoirs. Who is this for? You know, um, one of the things we really talked a lot about ourselves was as New Orleanians, are we reading this book differently than say folks are reading it, you know, in Richmond, Virginia, in Oakland, California, in Paris, France, like how are, how are people reading it differently elsewhere? And also as people living in New Orleans, what does it mean to have a book like this about us? Um, okay, so for locals reading this, I think it can, what am I trying to say? It can give you an outlook of a person who lives in the East. I'm from Algiers. I don't live in the East. None of my family are from the East. But back in the day, my mom would say, you know, the East was a place to live. Now, not so much. Mm -hmm. So if you're a person locally is giving you, is letting you connect to people in your city, even though you live in the same place, in the same city, you can still connect. And if you're reading it from Paris or France, you know, just giving you insight on different types of people mm -hmm. like that perspective you already have the city. Who knows about the East? If you're from here, what do you know about the East? You know? Nothing. Yeah. And so reading this, you're like, wow, this is, this is interesting. You know, this is how people live and this is how, yeah. Absolutely. I think we probably have viewers right now who are, who are watching this from the East, right? And I know like when I was reading it sometimes too, I had these little weird frizzons of recondition, you know, where he, she would talk about something that, that was very real for me because it was also someplace that I passed every day or it's something from my childhood, like Schwegman's, 
you know, and, and so you've got this like uh, secondary readership who are people in New Orleans who maybe also don't know that much about the East or maybe we do, you know? Um, yeah, Jada, did you want to add? I agree with Peyton again, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm from the cutoff and LJS. I never really go on the East like that. So I, it was gave me a different outlook. Mm -hmm. And like when I was reading the book, I couldn't really sit in the Wallace words. I was like, man, I must not go nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Caitlin has a comment for us. Um, this is Beckno TV, y'all. We've got a lot of students watching today, um, supporting these young women as they read to us. Um, but Jada, when we were talking about the book in class, one of the things that really came across was all the detail and how the de it was just really detailed, particularly that chapter, Map of Our World. And I know in your writing, you also are super detailed and what you read for us had lots of that, like, it gave you a feel of the place. You know, and I think that that's just really important, you know, um, and I'm wondering about like, are there any details about life in New Orleans now that you want to share that you would want to tell people if this was some if this was your, your story? That's a big question. <laughs> what would you want people to know about New Orleans? I feel like. Sometimes the ones do have a bad outlook. Like we look at the crime rate and we don't want to be here. Like sometimes, and then, you know, stuff. <laughs> so the ones is kind of a good place to live culturally. Like you got good food, mm -hmm. good things for that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think that the detail that I would want people to know is that we put community first, right? We have like, that's our superpower is our community and our community life. Um, certainly like at Beckno, we have a strong sense of belonging, but in general, like how we do our thing as a community is unique to our place. And we, we really put it first. We know how to throw a party because we can do it, but we also can throw a protest, right? We can also get, um, a, we had not one, but two books nominated for the National Book Awards, right? So this is this is how we show up, right? Because our community is so strong and our story is so important. And I love that Sarah Broom has centered our story in her book and made the city a part of her family in a way. Yeah, I wanna bring up um, our friend Megan Holt. Uh, Dr. Megan Holt is uh, from One Book, One New Orleans and uh, has a couple of questions for us as another reader of the book. Hi, thank you guys so much. This has been incredible. I mean, wow. They talk about high school and you know the quality of education our students get in New Orleans sometimes. This is another thing I think I want folks to know is our high schools kill it. They're doing so well, so thank you guys. Um, so you guys already kind of answered my first question, which was what did you hear about the East growing up? Because as young people in New Orleans, I wonder if you heard some of the same things Sarah Broome did ab about the place she was. So I think instead of asking that over again, mm -hmm. I wanna go to my next question, which is for me, and I'll set this up, the part of the book that resonated the most was the chapter four eyes when she describes having never seen properly mm. and needing glasses when she was a kid. And then when she got them realizing for the first time there were individual leaves on trees, because that was my experience. I, I could not see a thing <laughs> until I was eight years old. I got my first big Coke bottle glasses. And then all of a sudden the world looked completely different. And so that's like where I saw myself as someone who didn't grow up in New Orleans in this book. And I think that's another thing that really resonates with a lot of readers is even if you're not from New Orleans, you can see yourself. So I wanted to ask the students, what was the part of the book that resonated the most with you and connected most with you personally? Um, it was early on me like the opening first two or three chapters where she's mentioning her great grandmother and her grandmother and that part like you said you see yourself in the book even though i'm not from the east 
um, when she talked about her great grandmother being from the country or part of Louisiana, that's the same one for me. And it was just open, it was like eye opening for me because two different lives, two different age spans. You know, Sarah Broom, she's older than me. Her soul is her family, but it's almost like we live in the same life in a way. And I feel like that's why I connected so well with this book because I saw myself in her, like mm. my great grandmother, my grandmother, almost the same life. I'm like, it can't be the same thing across the board, but that part was really interesting to me. And I think that's what a lot of people in the city, if you grew up here, experienced. Mm -hmm. All right, the part where she was like, when she had to come out the house looking a certain way, like people would think how you live it, but you had to come out to represent. I feel like I really agree with that part. The mama always have us all dressed up. Like we'll go outside looking perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, my mom, remember who you are and whose you are. And when you go out, you look like you're representing the family, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I really resonated with the part when she's stuck in New York and her family's spreading out. She can't reach people. That was I, like Peyton. I was like, that was my experience. Exactly. And I remember everybody else was going about their lives. Like nothing was going on. And I'm like, people, this is big. <laughs> so I just stopped. I remember standing in the middle of Washington Square Park and seeing my friends were over there talking to each other, just having a normal day. And I just I couldn't bring myself to be a part of it. And I really that that part where she's going through that, just her and her sister in New York trying to find where her mama is. I, that was really intense for me. Next thing I want to do is start with Pete. I mean, not Pete. I'm sorry, Jade, Jada. Ugh. Since your essay is what inspired this question, Jada, um, I love that you brought up cutting grass because it's <laughs> another chapter that just touched my heart. It's the last chapter of the book, and here, as you pointed out, it's when he, Carl is tending to the property even after the house is gone. Why do you think, Jada, that Broom chose to end there and make that the final thing you see. I was thinking about that question a lot because I was like, why was she in here right here? But I would say she wanted to have, they always had a sense of home. Like they will always come back to it. Mm -hmm. Even though they spaced out, they will always have a place to go. Mm -hmm. And they will always feel like home to them, even if it's gone. I feel like that was the most important thing in the book. Mm hmm mm hmm Um, any other thoughts on that one? <laughs> I think Jada summed it up beautifully. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My next question is inspired by Peyton. So I'll start with you first. So I've been doing a lot of research on my own on memoir. And the common definition I keep coming up with is it's a slice of life. I'm sure you came up with this, too, when you were doing your research. And that seems to be kind of the go-to for a memoir. It's not a whole life. It's a slice of someone's life. But here you have this memoir. And it's not just a slice of her life. It's a slice of her family's life and a slice of her city's life. So I'm wondering if you think that this like sort of fits the traditional definition of a memoir or no. Ooh, yes. good question. Actually, in the beginning part of my research paper, I talked about that. Memoirs is not necessarily your life on its own. What you do with memoirs is you take collections of memories, whether it be from yourself or other people around you, and you piece them together. And that's what makes it that lifespan. Even like her whole life is basically mapped out in this memoir. In traditional memoirs, what you might see, you only see like a piece of life, like a childhood, and then you think about it and how it shaped your um life. But I think each piece of Sarah Broom's story created each memory made that lifespan together. So I think it could be in um traditional viewpoint of a memoir. And I also think there is no set idea of what a memoir is, you know? Mm -hmm. As long as like it's memory and you're shaping and you're talking about how it shaped your life and how it made you, it's a memoir. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And no doubt this book is going to push what counts as memoir and, and what is expected of memoirs from here on out, right? It's such, mm -hmm. has been such a pivotal book that I feel like we, we're we going to start seeing memoirs of houses pop up all over the place. <laughs> but maybe not as good as this one. Right, right, absolutely. Wonderful. Great. Well, um, are there any questions from the audience before we we head on out? Yes, Caitlin has to add that your family's past can also depict who you are. And I think that definitely comes up in the book, right? She starts with her family's past. Um, and also, Jada, in your essay, you talk about you interviewed your mom to find out a little bit more about your Katrina story. And I just thought that part was really beautiful. What was that experience like talking to your folks about their background and, and their, their experience with the water? Me, I was like, mom, why you ain't stay there? Why you ain't stay in Dallas, Texas? <laughs> and but I didn't realize, like, as I was interviewing different family members, I realized they had different stories. Like, I remember mm -hmm. I interviewed my cousin. She said that she was, she had to move from seventh grade and go to start at another school mm -hmm. in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. And it was a big change for her. Like, she had to lose everything, friends, start school over by school, school uniforms, even though they were struggling. And then during Katrina, it was like they was losing everything. Like, they was losing each other. They didn't know where nobody was at. Everything was happening. Then I interviewed my dad. He said he came back to New Orleans to help out New Orleans, build back up New Orleans. He said he went back to my old house. Like, I lived right up the street from my old house, but they rebuilt it now. And he said the ceiling was gone. The uh, half of the room was gone. It was like, it was crazy because I looked back at that and I was like, I don't have no baby pictures of me. I only like have like two or three baby pictures of me. Like, it's like, mm. And I was like one years old when that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I wanted to touch on that memoir part. Like, I feel like she went down a different like story time. She had vocal stuff to tell us about her siblings. Like, I was like, I ended up at writer's block. Like, I didn't know what to write because I was like, I wanted to go back and I want to know how her sister felt. Like, when she finally had just one thing, her father gave her one thing before he died, and then she stopped getting stuff from him. I want to know how she felt and what her thinking process was. Like, we already know the action stuff to them, but not what they was thinking. But I have to remember, this is her story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when we were talking, Jada, about the, about the piece that you wrote, it's like we wanted to account for all 12, you know, uh, children, broom children, you know, because, uh, and because we wanted to know the whole story of everybody um, and not stop at just, uh, you know, just Sarah's story. I, I found Lynette one of the most fascinating characters, too. I want to know how that was for her. Yeah. Um, Caitlin has a question for y'all. Were there any challenges with reading the book? Um, she admits to being a little confused by some of the details as we went along. Yes, I agree with that. Sometimes the book kind of jumped between characters sometimes and their stories connected. So like whose story is this who's talking? But I think once you go to get to the end and then you go back and realize, okay, this all makes sense. So yeah, I got a couple challenges, but it was worth it in the end. Um, go ahead. I started doing a couple of challenges to the point I had to start right at the beginning of the book what it was talking about. And like certain words I couldn't say. Like I was like, man, this is not really from New Orleans. Like I was sitting up there like especially when she was going back in details. I was like so confused. <laughs> Did everybody else start drawing a family tree? Yeah. Like I was like, uh, who's called who? What nickname goes with what person? Yeah, I started doing yeah. that too. I needed a little I need a little drawing in my book that was a, a who's who's who. Um, Justin Lamb um, has a question. Uh, he's, the, he's the Dean of Students at Barterley College and a poet, and he has a question about you all as writers. Um, do you see yourselves writing your own memoirs in the future? And if so, how do you think reading The Yellow House might impact your approach? Um, I think I would be interested. Right now, I don't have that big of a story to tell because my story isn't finished yet. But I think that um, that is something I'd be interested in since I love to write. In the Yellow House, 
the first memoir that I ever read, like in depth. And then it led me. So this is like a great end. I can talk about home here in New Orleans, my family. When I get to Nashville, hopefully that'll inspire me. So yes. Mm -hmm. I was interested also, like, I have, like, Buku diaries, like, I saved up for, like, sixth grade to remember everything, all the ways I was feeling, everything, and I feel like she really impacted me, because I have to really think of people outside of New Orleans, instead mm -hmm. of just people in my area. Mm -hmm. Jada, that's going to make a great memoir one day. Yes, yes, and Ana Maria says, we would love to read your memoir, Peyton. One of the things I know is that when when we we look at memoirs and it, as your essay clearly points out too is that sometimes it has to do with this pivotal moment that you don't know what's going to happen yet right and certainly when sarah broom's house got destroyed that was a pivotal moment that kicks off this memoir that certainly she wouldn't have wanted to have happen no so we don't know so you know we, we don't know what our memoirs are going to be like yeah um Byron says he would rather have his story be told by someone else and have creative input. I love it. I love it. And, and have somebody play you in the movie version. Absolutely. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up unless anybody wants to take the closing word. The last word, the last word. Well, I'm going to invite Liz Granite to come back up and tell us a little bit about what's happening next with One Book, One New Orleans on behalf of Bart Early College for reaching out to me and um, for all of my colleagues for their extraordinary work in helping us develop these essays. And of course, centering all of this are our amazing students. Thank you, Jada. And thank you, Peyton, for your bravery, your wisdom, and your powerful words. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Wow, Jesse, Jada and Peyton, that was amazing. Thank you. And Jada and Peyton, I am excited to see your vision and your leadership unleashed on our city. And I think we're all excited to read your memoirs too. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody who joined us tonight. Uh, we've got lots more events coming up based on themes in the Yellow House. And next up, we continue our discussion of the four movements of the book by delving into movement three. That's going to be on Thursday, June 10th at 6.30 p.m. And you can stay tuned to our Facebook page for updates on events. Now, before we get to June, does everyone know what's coming up in the month of May for the nonprofits of New Orleans? It's Give NOLA Day! Woo! It's on May 4th, and Give NOLA Day is a 24-hour event that's hosted by the Greater New Orleans Foundation to inspire people to give generously to nonprofits, making our region stronger and creating a thriving community for all. So if you enjoyed tonight's event and appreciate elevating the voices of people like Peyton and, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and Jada, then please consider making a donation. Our Give Nola Day gifts will all be used to purchase and distribute copies of the Yellow House to adult education programs, uh, to incarcerated adults, incarcerated teens, and to host free public programming inspired by the book. You can visit givenola.org slash onebookonenola to donate. We so appreciate your support and we look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you.